Welcome to our space today. I am really glad to see so many folks here, places I have traded so many emails with and never met in person. Um, to see you now and then also folks that I have seen for a long time. Um, Jojo is now uh, works with me, so she will be helping with some of the tech, hopefully. Between the both of us, we will get this down, right? Because I, I have never used Zoom in this way before to do, uh, to be as, to use all the features that we're going to try and use tonight. So I'm excited about learning new things. So grateful about learning new things. The training tonight is called Widening, Widening the Window of Tolerance, and it comes to us from the Traumatic Stress Institute. I'm a trained facilitator for them, so I've done the train the trainer kind of situation, and they offer um, occasional retrainings. So this is uh, uh, not retrainings, but new information. So this is new information that they haven't hadn't talked about before. So we're I'm bringing it to you from them. Jojo also, by the way, is uh, works for the Archdiocese of Seattle, so she has kind of two roles working with us and then also working uh, with the Archdiocese in the same kind of situation, but her work with the Archdiocese is specifically with the Roman Catholic volunteers and youth. Okay. Uh, would, how about if we do brief introductions going around, so like name, uh, faith, tradition, and how long you've been hanging out in detention. So, all right. And we'll do it it's by a method called mutual invitation. So just invite the next person, which means you kind of got to keep track of who's been called and who hasn't been called. Um, so I will invite Rita. So, Rita Armagas, I live in Falls City, and um, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. We have been involved in the prison work since the late 90s, started with county, state, federal facilities. We started with Echo Glen in 2007 and have been consistently there since 2007. Have so appreciated and enjoyed this uh, form of ministry and um, have appreciated learning and applying uh, to these young ones uh, from such trauma-based background, um, the comfort in the scriptures and the, the encouragement to watch their faces change and their confidence build has been a joy. And then you get to call the next person. Oh, should we go by uh, alphabetical? How about Jojo? It's a B. Great. Yes, thank you. And also, I was just going to note too, I don't know if anyone, I'm getting a little bit of feedback and for the recording purposes, maybe while people aren't speaking, if we could mute um, just in case there's any issues with the sound. I don't know if anyone else is getting that, but I was kind of getting some feedback. But um, anyways, hi, sorry. Hi, I'm Jojo. Um, I work, as Terry said, with uh, Circle Faith Future at Echo Glen and King County um, Juvenile Detention, um, as well as with the Archdiocese. And I've been doing this work since about 2009, 2010, um, and uh, uh, raised Catholic and um, work with, as Terry said, Catholic volunteers uh, at both locations as well. So excited to be here. You get to call the next person. Thank you. Yes. Um, Lori, I'm going to give you a call on you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Lori Thorpe. Don't go by Laurel. Um, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses and I've had the privilege of coming in with Rita uh, to Echo Glen since 2007. And then also worked with her at a um, woman's work release home in Seattle for many, many years and have enjoyed all aspects of this work. I've raised three boys. <laughs> They're now men. Um, and so <clears throat> have really enjoyed, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> working with kids down at Echo Glen. Um, it's, it's been a challenge um, and it's been very rewarding. So look forward to doing more. And let's call on. 
Andrea Tatum. Hi, I'm Andre Tatum. It's pronounced Andre, but I answer anything close. My husband is Pastor Don Tatum. We're with Bible Study Outreach Ministry, and we actually started out at Echo Glen probably in about 1994, 93, 94, somewhere in there. And about a year later, we were at Juvie. Uh, we started there because I had a cousin who was incarcerated, for lack of a better word. And she said that they needed some people down there. So we went. She was actually at Juvie. And when we went to Juvie, they said, well, well let's check at Echo Glen. And so we went there first. At any rate, we love being there. I don't go as often as I would like to. I used to go a lot, but I don't as much. Um, uh, we have a team of people that go out there now. Uh, Sister Christine, Sister Shatina, I think you may know them, and Sister Valerie is at Juvie, but uh, we love working with the kids and watching them grow and watching them ask questions, get curious about who Jesus is and what Jesus did and, and about Holy Week and about Easter and about Christmas, so we really just love sharing the Word of God and giving everybody what God has said for them, that they don't have to live this way, that God has a, a better plan for them and get them involved in the plan that the Lord has for them. So that's about it, I guess. They can probably add some more since they go more than I do. Um, I'm not sure if Sister Christine can talk. I think she's driving on her way to Juvie. Can you talk, Sister Christine? Because she actually heads up the ministry right now. Yeah, I can. Good evening. Um, so my name is Sister Christine. Um, I've been going out to Echo Glen in King County, Julie, about 20 years. Uh, my faith is Christian, and I just enjoy what I do for the Lord. Um, I build really, really um, wonderful relationships with the youth, and uh, just excited to see them. A lot of times, um, those that get out of King County, Echo Glen, you know. Okay. Like I said, she's driving. Yeah. Sometimes we hit some uh, spots on the road. Yeah. yeah. So Should I some, somebody different? Yeah, let's go. Let's, why don't you do that? Ah, uh, I don't know anybody. How about Christian? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Christian Carey, and uh, I'm a parishioner at Mary Queen of Peace uh, and uh, in Sammamish. Um, been doing youth ministry there. You know, I have three kids that grew up in the church and uh, I've been helping out with the youth ministry there with uh, some Amish teenagers for like the last 15 years and uh, decided, you know, God was calling me to something even more challenging than um, suburban um, Catholic kids um, from in more or less intact families and uh, started going to uh, Echo Glen back in 2019, started doing some uh, teaching of uh, how to manage your money. And um, then COVID hit and that all stopped and uh, decided I'd like to be uh, doing Bible study when the, when, when the facility opened up again and started doing that at uh, one of the cottages had a group Bible study and then found that after working with uh, Greg, and I forget his name, Terry, his last name, Terry, uh, that was the chaplain there for years. Um, okay. Yeah, and an African-American gentleman. Yeah, um, yes. we worked with him also. I, I was kind of getting a little frustrated and I kind of decided I would, I would watch the master at work and see how he did it and learned so much and decided I was going to start doing it instead of groups, doing it one-on-one -on -one with individual uh, uh, boys. And so I've been doing that ever since. I kind of have uh, two or three going at a time um, and do it. It's, a, it's now become a, a kind of a combination of Bible study and, and just straight mentoring and being a sounding board 
for for the boys uh, on whatever they want to talk about and seeing if I can land a little bit of my own experience in life uh, to help give them some guidance. And that has just been so rewarding. It's just amazing. It's the favorite thing I do now in, in retirement is, is go to Echo Glen twice a week. Um, and I don't know who hasn't gone yet because I kind of joined a little bit late. Is there anybody who hasn't gone yet? Um, okay, Suzanne. Hi, I'm Susan Frank, and I have been going to King County for, I think it's been 11 or 12 years, um, volunteering as a chaplain. And um, I also volunteered up at Denny and Everett for nine years, um, up until they closed in COVID and I haven't been able to get back in. But I have, in addition to that, been going to Echo Glen since I think, I think maybe six years now, I'd have to look it up. But um, so now um, going into both King County and Echo Glen once a week and really love doing one-on-ones. That's my preferred way to do work. But I've noticed a lot lately that I have had several opportunities to work with two or three girls at once or two or three boys who just happen to be there and are interested in Bible study. And so we'll just read a little passage and then talk about it. I like to pray with them. I love to help people figure out um, who they are, what their identity is, and also, I, I love the Bible, so I, I help them find things in the Bible and give them little places where they can look and read and find encouragement. So I really love this work. And I will call on Larry and Jana. I'll come up front for you can kind of see me and hear me better. Larry, one of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I think me and Jan started in about uh, 2008 uh, when we had more time. Jan had more time at that time, and of course I was made it myself available so that I could help the, the boys. That had many, many good studies with many of the, the boys up there, always had productive studies. Some that uh, eventually moved on, some that got in trouble even more. We had a good rapport with uh, many of the counselors. Uh, we always appreciated uh, them. They always helped us in many, many ways. Um, I can't think of anything else. Nothing exciting, anyhow. Uh, I, can, I, can Jan, I can let Jan take over. Well, I started with Rita down at uh, Kent in the jail down there. And when they opened up the work in Echo Glen, I was given the opportunity to join her there after my mom passed away and I had more time. So uh, like Larry said, it's probably some of the most heartwarming and heartbreaking work that we can possibly do trying to help these kids that seem to be lost in so many ways. Um, and yeah, after having raised four kids of our own, we feel like <laughs> we know a lot of the tricks that they'll pull and a lot of the questions that they have and a lot of the attitudes and how to get through and um, help them help themselves. So yeah, we enjoy the work too. You're supposed to call on somebody. Oh, let's see. Gina, you haven't gone yet, have you? Gina Jones. Gina. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been uh, volunteering at Echo Glen for over 10 years now, mentoring mainly. I also attend the socials and um, every other month. Um, yeah. When I'm mentoring, I'm, I'm just down the street from them. So it's, it's easy for me to, to go over there. Um, and yeah, I enjoy it. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. How about Alyssa? Hello, 
Uh, I'm Alyssa. I'm a student at Seattle University right now, um, and I was raised Catholic, and I'm a confirmed uh, Catholic in the church, uh, and I volunteered down at the King County Detention Center right there, and I've been there for only a month, but I absolutely love it so far, um, and I think it's just a really great experience, um, and I have Jojo and Terry to thank for allowing me to go there and showing me the ropes and everything. Um, yeah, there's not much to it. I'm sorry. Haven't been there very long. Um, Valerie Jackson. Hello, everybody. Y'all might be getting the feedback from me, so sorry if that's the case. Um, but my name is Valerie and I'm with Bible Study Outreach Ministries under the direction of Pastor Donald Tatum uh, and his wife, Sister Tatum. I do co-labor with Sister Christine um, and Sister Shatina. I have been in juvie, I don't know, maybe 15 years, maybe somewhere in there. Um, and being a recipient of um, being incarcerated as a juvenile, I definitely can relate to when children are looking um, for an identity. And so um, not to go all into that, but I do share that with them so that they know I am there with them. You know, I can relate. Um, um, uh, it is also an uh, a opportunity to let them see what Jesus can do that you don't have to be that person. Uh, you are just a decision away. And so just reminding them that they do have the power to make decisions. Um, and so it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's, they make me laugh. Um, I do learn a lot of the, uh, oh, what do they call it? The, 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 just the way they function, because it's so different from when I grew up. You know, and so, and that's the thing with them. They'd be like, well, when you was old, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, no. I mean, those problems still exist. We just in a different time. But it is, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to share the love of Jesus with those. And I say babies because I'm from the South, but they're not babies. They're young men and young women. And so it's, it's, it's just a blessing to, to do that. And I will call on, I'm not sure who all has been, um, Shatina. Oh, you haven't been? Well, you know what? Let's, let's do the one that raised his hand up. How about that? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Jeff. And this is my wife, Michelle, and we're Jehovah's Witnesses. We've been doing Echo Glen about four years. We're newbies. Newbies. <laughs> um, but we love it. And uh, I think what we try to work with the, whether it's, well, mostly we've worked with boys as a couple, which I think is somewhat of an advantage at times because we kind of bring both sides, mom and dad to the plate. And uh, our focus generally is try to just show them how Bible principles can be so powerful, dealing with anger, decision-making, um, validation and so forth. And the other trick that we found very effective is to work with the counselors in the cap cottages. And if they notice a specific issue or something going on with one of our students, then we try to kind of backdoor it a little bit with a Bible principle or two and try to help reinforce what they're working with so that the they're getting a consistent statement, I guess. Um, both from their counselor as well as from a, a spiritual side. So it seems to work, work well. I can't add too much more to that. <laughs> I really do have enjoyed working with, with them so much. And it was hard not going in. <clears throat> we still have, uh, we still have this, one, this one boy that we've been, you know, we've been on the phone because we haven't been able to get the Zoom thing going it's consistently, but we, he's still hanging in there. and, and uh, we feel really good helping them feel better about themselves by using the Bible. And, and it seems like they, most of them really respect the Bible and, and God. So we enjoy it. So now we'll call on Sheila. <laughs> I'm Sheila Gay. Um, 
everybody's pretty much covered for Jehovah's Witnesses. We've been there since 2007. And I think it was brought out that we, we, um, we like to in, uh, do uh, the one-on-one -on -one as well because it works so well in uh, tailoring it to that young person and finding out what's going on with them. But over the years, um, I've just loved showing them the Bible principles, um, helping them to see the, the power of, of the Holy Spirit and that there's, there's something greater out there that can really, really help. And um, maybe many times um, a father wasn't, wasn't someone that, that you could trust. So it's, it's nice to help someone to see that there is someone you can turn to even when other, others disappoint you constantly. So in, in that sense, it's been really rewarding. So am I bringing up the rear here or who else haven't we heard from? Got my glasses. Sister Shatina. Shatina. Last but not least, um, no, I'm just playing. I'm playing. I can't help myself. Um, I'm uh, Shatina. I am with Bible Study Outreach Ministries as well under Pastor Don Tatum and under Sister Andre Tatum. And um, I base my time uh, being out at Echo Glen on my youngest two children. I was pregnant with my youngest son when I started, and he is 26. So I've been out there. Um, I started in Tootle at that time, and I was in Tootle for... I think maybe about nine, 10 years or so. Um, and I did that with Sister Christine um, as well. And for the past 12 years, I've been at Tootle. And, um, um, and that has been a, a really good um, uh, group that we have out there. A lot of transition goes on in that, in the, in that particular cottage, but, um, but it has really just been a, a blessing. They, they are an anchor a lot of times for, for us. And, um, and they don't know how much of a blessing they really are to us. You know, they, they really are to us. And um, to see that when, when they are hopeful again, when they do get some hope and they begin their relationship with the Lord themselves, it's really a blessing to see. And that's, um, that's what this is all about. We just want to introduce them to Jesus and, and, um, and that they have that relationship with him. So I am beyond eternally grateful that God allows me to meet them in this cross path of their lives and, and get to know them. And, um, and I just take them into my heart as my own. They become my kids. You know, those are my boys or those are my girls, you know. So, um, but it's just, it's been a blessing. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you to everyone who shared. I really appreciate it. I feel like we should add up all the years of experience and we might have like 200 years of experience right here in this room, which is uh, amazing. And sis Shatina, our kids are the same age. <laughs> Mine are still in my house though. So <laughs> you got any tips? <laughs> all right, it is time to get started. Um, it, intros went a little bit longer than I had planned, but here we go. And uh, Jojo will help me keep on track from a technology standpoint and let me know if I'm getting off. Um, also, uh, let me know, Jojo, if there's any comments because I can't watch the comments and watch um, the what's uh, what I'm happening, what I'm talking about. So it's hard for me to do. That. I got you. Okay? Yes, I got All right. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to be talking about the window of tolerance, which is um, just not not like being tolerant of other people, but it's a very specific thing um, that we can use as a strategy to work with the youth to help them um, become uh, become all the things that we wish and dream for them. So. So before we get started, because this is kind of part of it and what we'll learn, we're going to uh, do a noticing exercise. 
Um, and so if we just take a minute, put your feet on the ground if you can, except for Sis Christine, keep on driving. Uh, and just notice the state of your nervous system in your body. Where in your body do you feel what's happening right now? Just kind of scan your body from head to your toes. What does it feel like? What physical sensations are you noticing? What would you like to say to your nervous system right now? Do you feel calm, steady, amped up, or low energy? So the window of tolerance is based on the work of a guy named Dan Siegel, and it is the range where we operate at our normal behavior. So we have like a, a border on top and bottom. Like if we get stressed, we might pop out of it, and then we start acting out of anger or fear. If we are depressed, then we go underneath of it and we're not acting out of it at all. But doing these noticing exercises help us uh, stay within our window of tolerance and then also to make the window of tolerance wider. So uh, anyway, that's just a simple noticing exercise that you can do with yourself and with youth when you See that they're agitated or whatever they are and we'll get into why all of this works and how it comes together so in a lot of ways right now our families the youth we work with our agencies the churches we have been shut down during COVID, and we are just beginning to wake up i know um my church has been had three people in the pews because uh we are um, broadcasting from church. So I'm there every Sunday. But uh, so we're broadcasting from church. We have three people in the pews. And then this coming Easter Sunday is going to be our first time back as a church family. So it's just this time that we're just beginning to wake up. And a lot of people have had a lot of stress during this time. And it has really compressed the people's abilities to be tolerant or to have good behaviors in that way. So as people, as us who connect to others and support other people, or as the Trauma Stress Institute calls it, calls everyone who helps other people treaters. So we are treating them through our love and our connection. We know that humans are wired for connection. And so the shutdowns in our families, our schools, our workplaces, our communities at detention has had major negative impacts on everyone. So even the youth with all the stress and trauma that has led to them being in detention, it's amplified by what has happened during the pandemic with the quarantines situation going up and down and the volunteers not being there as much as we would like. So us as treaters, we also know that in part the shutdowns in our real life are healthy and can be an adaptive response to a difficult experience. So sometimes we shut down because we need to shut something out. But to effectively manage stress and heal trauma, especially during and after traumatic events or global pandemics, we have to open up on our inside by widening both our individual and collective windows of tolerance. So we're going to take a deeper dive into the window of tolerance, including strategies and practices that we can use to widen our own window of tolerance and to support youth in widening their window of tolerance to promote healing. Because life is simply better with a wider window of tolerance. Okay, are you ready? Ready. All right, we're gonna do a window of tolerance poll because I learned how to do polls and I'm inflicting them on you. So there you go. Um, do you see the poll on the screen? No, okay. How do we make this show up? Relaunch poll, there we go. There, do you have it now? Yes, we should, everyone should see it now. All right, awesome sauce. 
So it's not a really big poll. It has one question, so it shouldn't take that long to do. Excuse me, are we supposed to respond to this? Yeah, sure if you want to. If you don't want to, you can just uh, wait and then I'll oh, okay. share the results. It's up to you. Thank you. No problem. Could you have picked more than one choice? Absolutely. Ah, well, I want my, I want oh. my paper back. <laughs> I, <laughs> I would have too. clicked a lot more. <laughs> Me too. I, it's not my fault. I didn't create the, well, I did create some of the poll, but yeah, there, it was a tricky, tricky. There's only one question that is not true on the whole thing. The, all the answers are true. All right. I'm going to end the poll since the cat is out of the bag, right? But um, let's see, the one that got the most popular answers or the most people chose is that it describes the level of stress activation that we can tolerate without moving into hyper arousal or hypo arousal. Let's see that. Right. So uh, window of tolerance is the space within us that we can feel that we're comfortable and safe. So it's something we really want to help our youth have because we want them to feel comfortable and safe when we are together as much as they can within the setting that they're in. Um, the, it's a helpful way to describe the difference between a normal response and a malfunctioning response. It is the level of stress that we can tolerate. Um, and for a healthy window of tolerance, there is a constant kind of ebb and flow of how much stress that we can take without being popped outside of what we can handle. And uh, the window of tolerance is founded in neuroscience, not not, not in neuroscience. So it is uh, based in neuroscience. Um, I am really a geeky person. I love to study, which is why I'm working on my PhD. And so part of that, I like help. We can bring our brain and our bodies into alignment with what we're learning, what we're teaching about mentoring, what we're teaching as religious service providers, then it just helps it go further, faster. So. The window of tolerance represents the amount of stress one can manage without losing our connection to others. That's from David Treleden, I'm going to say. I don't know. I've never met him, so I don't know how his name is pronounced. So we'll go with Trilidan. So just a quick note uh, on the neuroscience and biology behind it. So we can help ourselves and their youth by working with our bodies in the way they were designed rather than working against it. So all we really need to know about the neuroscience is that the first thing that stimulus from the outside world hits in our brain is right here at the bottom at the amygdala or the brainstem. And that happens before it reaches our feeling brain or our thinking brain. And so for folks who have been traumatized or in a threat situ situation, that part of their brain is hyperactive and it sends out stress hormones throughout their entire bodies and puts them immediately into fight, flight, or freeze responses. So all this happens before they can even think about it. The amygdala is one of the first parts of the brain that develops when we're babies, well before our prefrontal cortex, which is up here and is our thinking parts of our brain. And these habits can be uh, 
can be formed before we're even capable of thinking. So if we think of youth who have experienced trauma at the hands of caregivers when they're children or infants or children, those responses are deep within them and it takes an extraordinary effort to uh, meet them where they are and to be gentle enough to help them move beyond just that immediate response that is right there at the brainstem level. Also, when that amygdala is stuck on, as it gets stuck on in the trauma uh, cases of trauma, it decreases the window of tolerance. But what I find most um, concerning is that the constant stress hormones affect people's health and it decreases their lifespan. So by working with them, we are helping our youth to have more abundant lives, the life that was designed for them and promised to them that they can reach out. So working with their biology, doing what we actually do will help them have the good life that they can live and that they can achieve. So a normal threat response is here. The window of tolerance is fairly wide. Um, it, just normal life goes through the activation and calm. So you go up and down. Um, sometimes we get poked out into hyperarousal, like in the middle of the night, if some glass breaks on the other side of the house and everybody's asleep, hyperarousal happens very fast for me. <laughs> so those kind of things are hypoarousal, which we can notice like uh, when people talk about binging on Netflix or things like that, that is the kind of freeze response, which is hypoarousal where they're going down because their lives are too stressful. So they're just trying to tune out so when it's up at the top, hyperarousal, you get fight or flight. When it's down at the bottom, you get that freeze response or what they call a fawn response is where people um, as a uh, survival mechanism will start like sucking up to leaders, right? So they will start sucking up to people that might do them harm because by uh, fawning over them, they, avoid being harmed. So we often are taught that it's fight or flight, but it's fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. There's the four responses. Right. So inside the window of tolerance, when we are cooperating between our thinking brain and our survival brain, are working together at their best, the survival brain down here can accurate, accurately read the environment for signs of danger, safety, and stability. It can assess the safety and danger accurately. Um, it keeps the normal functions of your heart rate, breathing, digestion, all of that. Um, it keeps it going at a normal level. And the thinking brain is operating in the way it's supposed to by managing um, executive functioning skills of organization, emotional regulation, critical thinking, and decision making. So when the survival brain and thinking brain are in sync with each other, they will function effectively together and it supports recovery uh, completely. However, when the uh, window of tolerance is narrow. We often find youth or people that are stuck in on, they're in that fear, anxiety, rage, and panic kind of area, or they're stuck in off, which is depression and numbness, cutting off, um, withdrawn. They're the kind of escape, uh, the people we see that have habits of escape, escapism. So that's kind of the stuck off. And then the people that have habits of aggression feel like they're in the stuck on um, kind of parts. When that window of tolerance is narrowed, the survival brain, which is that down there at the bottom, will misread the environment. So the survival brain controls all of those basic functions. Again, the heart rate, breathing, digestion, sleeping. So it will misread that, it will disrupt everything. Your heart rate, the breathing, digestion, sleeping will be bad. All of those things that are have the important job of just keeping us alive, having that narrower window of tolerance effects. And then it also makes the 
frontal prefrontal cortex where our thinking brain is just go offline it's like it doesn't even exist because it is just functioning at a response level so the threat response malfunctions executive functioning is disruptive social relationships are disruptive emotions are dysregulated and uh, less resilience is uh, developed so i wanted to think of an example about this of with somebody who was operating in with a very narrow window of tolerance and one of the things that happened and i remember i think it was the first year that i was at king county juvenile detention and i was having a conversation with a young man and he was telling me about a friend of his who accidentally shot someone and in my brain it was like how do you accidentally shoot someone right but it was he was walking down the street and a car backfired and he his window of tolerance was so narrow and his trauma experiences were so great that he heard that sound and immediately pulled out his gun and shot someone it was there was no thought between there and there it was purely a survival instinct which is right there at the uh, lower at the brain stem level so that is how you accidentally shoot someone. So the conditions that narrow the window of tolerance, I think most of us know a lot of these childhood adversities. There's the study, the ACEs study, which is adverse childhood experiences, developmental trauma, shock trauma. Um, and I think we'll see this going up um, with the amount of wildfires and extreme weather that we're having uh, lately chronic stress, especially due to racism, the pandemic, poverty, uh, those kind of things. All of those things add up to what we call the allostatic stress load, which is just the sum total of all of our stress. So we have the sum total of our stress and it can override then uh, the other systems in our brain. Also, there's the thinking brain override that can happen also that will narrow our window of tolerance. So this is a little bit more of a difficult concept to um, grasp because the thinking brain override will be things that might look healthy, but people are using them to escape their feelings, right? So maybe it's running right great exercise is good for the body and it actually does alleviate stress to a degree but if you're using it to escape uh, looking at your situation and looking at why you're stressed then it is not helpful so that's a thinking brain override so we think we're doing something good but it's actually just escape because we're not addressing the the issue and so much of the work that we all do as religious care providers and spiritual advisors and mentors is uh, sitting with youth while they are talking about the realness of their lives right. So the allostatic which is the total stress cycle as it goes through is like starts out at stress activation they never really recover from stress. So the stress load keeps accumulating, the window of tolerance narrows, emotional dysregulation, um, misbehavior increases, then it just is a vicious cycle that keeps going around and around and creating a narrower and narrower window of tolerance. All right, here's our next poll and it is three questions. And let's see if I can figure out how to do this poll. Uh, Wait, poll number two, launch. Okay, I think it's there. This is the new thing that I learned how to do is to do polls. <laughs> and you did it very well, Terry. You did a great Thank job. You so much. Yeah.
Terry, we lost it because of technical difficulties. Can you put it back up? Oh, uh, it froze. It froze on us. Oh, I, uh, I have Maybe. to. Sh I, I think okay. you should be okay. <laughs> yeah, and I think you should be able to at the bottom where it kind of shows the chat share screen. There's polls, quizzes. If you select that, it might bring it up for you. Okay or like the kind of general menu by where your mute video buttons, there should no, be we're, a... we're on an iPad, oh well. Oh, okay, yeah, no It'll worries. Be okay. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to uh, end the poll and share the results. So I don't know if you can see them now, but on most of the questions, the answers were always infrequently except for the emotional dysregulation one, um, right, where we see pe whether people lose access to their thinking brain. Um, the most common one was frequently, but there are still times where we rarely, rarely see it, right? A wider variability on whether we actually witness that or not. But it's very easy, we can see, to pop outside of that window of tolerance and uh, see how people compartmentalize. And all of those things are not dealing with the stressors. So it will cause problems down the line. If people only compartmentalize and that's all that they do, it will cause problems eventually. <laughs> so I'm not familiar with what exactly compartmentalize means. Mm. So um, sometimes we call it bracketing. Um, so when I, and it's like when you have an emotion that you can't deal with, right? Especially if you're talking to someone and it's really not a good or safe place to address an emotion or something that has harmed you and you just put it aside and bracket it off and say you're gonna deal with it later and you never ever deal with it, right? Um, watching a TV show, 9-11, uh, Lone Star. <laughs> so it's all these like 9 one uh, one um, situations with fire people and all this stuff. And like, they are the experts on the show of compartmentalizing and not dealing with the trauma that they see on a daily basis, right? So if we think about first responders, they probably have a lot of that that they do. So the thinking brain override that I mentioned earlier, which is that um, really suppression compartmentalization, that idea of just sucking it up, right? Um, so the thinking brain just uh, takes over and it doesn't let you uh, process or deal with whatever it is that has gotten, that has narrowed your window of tolerance. Um, it can be all of these things or none of these things, it could be caffeine or nicotine or alcohol or food, anything that uh, interrupts the natural processes of dealing with the things that are before you. Again, it's that vicious cycle that narrows the window of tolerance that we uh, discussed earlier. So our windows have encountered problems. There are difficult life circumstances and they have closed or at least narrows. So our window of tolerance have narrowed in responses to difficult experiences that are often out of our control. ACEs, uh, adverse childhood experiences, chronic stress, trauma, all of those things. And they also narrow as a result of short-term adaptive behaviors, which are the thinking brain overrides, right? Those are short-term adaptive behaviors that if you let go into the long-term, uh, cause more harm than good. So how can we actively participate in widening our windows and supporting the widening of the youth the widening of the windows of the youth we work with and supporting their healing? That's the question before us. 
So strategies for widening the window is just one, practice healthy daily habits, help the youth. Uh, you know, they don't have a lot of things in their control, but I have noticed that some of the things that they choose to eat are quite extraordinarily yuck. So, <laughs> right? Um, so there, we can encourage our youth to stay healthy. That is not, um, uh, a deep conversation, you know, when we are with them, make sure that they are eating their meals when they're offered. We don't make sure, but suggest. Like if I'm with a youth and it crosses over into the dinner hour, I always notice that dinner is being served and I encourage them to go get food. If they want me to stay, they go get it and bring it back and eat it while we're talking so that they are covering their own healthy daily habits. Um, and I would suggest that it's even an ethical imperative that we do this work so that we don't bring harm to the youth that we are working with. The other is strengthening the inner capacities of the youth that we work with. So through mindful practices, we can help uh, bring ideas to strengthen their inner capacities, which is what much of our conversations are about, helping them strengthen their inner capacities, the living by biblical principles or mentoring and creating uh, plans for the future and uh, change plans, all those kind of things, uh, is helping them strengthen their inner capacities. So mindfulness at its core is simply noticing your thoughts while you're thinking them. So you have to slow down enough that you can actually notice what you're thinking and feeling, which is why we did that body check and scan at the beginning. So you're noticing what you're feeling within your body. So I'm reading the Book of Joy, which is by the Dalai Lama and Archb Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu. And the Dalai Lama starts every day with five hours of meditation. And Desmond Tutu, uh, before he passed, started each day with four hours of prayer. Like, those are extraordinary practices. I am convinced that those practices are what lead these men to be able to transform their sorrow to joy. And so you can read it in the uh, read about their lives and how that helps them change change things in their book. Uh, if you want to, the book of joy. I'm enjoying it quite a lot. So prayer, meditation, those are things that help uh, widen the window. So there are things that we do already. And so teaching prayer to youth can help them to widen their window of tolerance. But we're not saying, hey, we're going to help your neuroscience, right? We're saying, we're going to help you learn how to pray so that you are better connected to God, or we're going to help you meditate so that you are able to uh, calm yourself in the way that you want to, whatever it is that uh, is before us in the youth, or we're going to help you make plans that can help you get through this, right? And you're going to, even just talking about things that are, that they can notice, right? The signs of stress activation, faster breathing, difficulty breathing, faster heart rate, nausea or butterflies in the stomach sometimes, a dry mouth or any of these things. I'm not gonna read them all. So uh, many, these are signs. So we can help youth notice them or we can notice them in the youth. I um, recently, not, well, semi-recently, uh, was visiting with a youth, and I could just see the sadness. It was like a huge, felt to me like a huge cloud. Like I just walked in the room, and I could just feel it everywhere. And we just sat in, you know, the little back rooms in the cottage, sat in the back room in silence for almost an hour, just in silence. And it was just an extraordinary feeling of being in solidarity. Um, but it's what he needed was not more stimulation at that point. He just needed, it felt to me, he needed that someone to be there with him. So 
sometimes you can just see it in the youth and then you're able to respond and bring in your skills that can adapt to whatever strength, stress activation you're seeing before you. So there are a couple exercises that you can do also. There's a contact point exercise, which is what we did before is uh, sitting, having them sit in a chair, asking them to notice the felt sense of their body, scanning their body for any places that is holding tension or tightness, um, and just talking them through that and letting them know, you know, if your mind wanders, it's not judgment, just return your attention to your body and whatever is connected to your body, to the chair, to the floor. And it's a very simple practice, but it's effective. And it just takes two to five minutes each day. It's a basic mindfulness practice that builds the capacity to notice their experiences in the present moment without judgment, which is a skill that they need to build on so that when they are in other situations, they can notice their own experience and their own thoughts without uh, having to go immediately to the, uh, the, the reactionary response of their lower brainstem, the amygdala, that they can get into a habit that helps them notice their own thoughts. So that's why it's so great when we are able to draw them out in um, a group setting or one-on-one -on -one settings when we're talking about study and asking their questions and getting their input about what are they thinking about this scripture or what are they thinking about this task right now at this point in time, right? So it helps them just do the noticing. Then we can notice when they are recovering from that. And here's a list of things. Um, laughing and giggling, I thought was really funny. I mean, not funny, but it, it is so true. I um, led a retreat some years ago with women whose loved ones were incarcerated. And it was a, uh, it was a religious retreat. So um, there was a forgiveness ritual in that. And it's very serious and solemn forgiveness kind of ritual. And after everybody was done and they went and sat down together, it was laughter, like the joy and the laughter that came up. It was this nervous system discharge and it was, uh, it was really fun. It was really fun. It went from sorrow to joy in just a moment of time. There's also a ground and release exercise, which is kind of builds on the contact point exercise that we just did. Um, and this is something to do after a small stress activation, but it's, you shouldn't do it if they're, they are being activated at the time. So they should be in a calm state of mind. Um, so basically what they do is recall an incident that was a moderate stressor. So it could be like an argument with a youth or like, I feel like half of the conversation sometimes with youth are like how aggravated they are with staff, right? So it could be an argument with a staff person. So just to be able to walk through that, have them still themselves, become quiet, notice what's going on in their body as they are recalling this incident to you. And uh, then they can identify the stressors as they're happening. And as they focus on their body, body sensation without moving away from it or changing the experience, you can encourage them to express their stress, what has activated their stress while they're noticing their body. And then you might see those uh, stress uh, relieving things, like they might start yawning or they might giggle or any of those things as they tell you about the stress, but are also listening to their body and bringing it into a calm state of being. So that is something that we can do too. There are a hundred different ways that each of you probably already know that can are exercises and things that you can do with youth that will help them be grounded 
and still and be able to notice what is going on inside them and to be able to express it to you whether you're meeting them in a Bible study or whether you're meeting them in a mentoring session, just being there and being able to draw those things out, you're helping them to process that and widen their window of tolerance. So I think you, at the end, when we get into small groups, you can talk together about ways you think that you can use what you actually do in your daily practice to widen, help widen that with the youth. There's our big idea. A wide window of tolerance enhances their decision-making, connection, their own agency over their own lives, their well-being, and their healing. Widening the window of tolerance limits that thinking brain override. It maximizes healthy daily habits, and it is practices complete recovery from stress and trauma that builds attentional control, so their mind control and their body awareness. Thank you. Life is simply better with a wider window of tolerance. That's basically it. Right. I do have an announcement before we break into groups. So if you will hold the date, I said this at the beginning, but not everybody was here. Hold the date for May 14th um, for Snoqualmie UMC. I had written down 10 to noon, but the time will probably slide out a little bit as we um, uh, uh, get closer to the date. And Jojo and I are able to sit down and plan exactly what we're going to do with our day on May 14th. But we're going to do visioning and goal setting, and we would really like to do it in collaboration with everybody who's here, all the volunteers, rather than bringing something and putting it on to y'all, have us create it together. I like collaboration, it's my jam. All right, waiting for everyone to come back. Everybody gets on a wavelength mm -hmm. and starts talking, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We were talking in our group about how, um, I guess, grateful we are for the good direction and training we have from the scriptures and from, you know, the way we were, we've been raised, mm -hmm. depending on how we were raised. But I mean, it, and now through our organizations that we are involved with. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody have anything they want to share from their breakout rooms? Other, Rita shared a little bit. I think no. No. Any ideas? I wanted to share in our breakout room, we had um, Christian shared a lot of really good insight on how he worked with the youth there on um, giving them, you know, um, a good, what does it look like when you're doing this? Or what does it look like when you're doing this? So he's putting out two, as I understand, he was putting out two different scenarios for the youth. And I thought it was just amazing on how he was working with them. And um, his analogy of what he was working with them for an outcome for them. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it was kind of like, um, yeah, like with a 16 year old, I'll say, okay, here's your life at 30. Here's your, you know, tell me your gangbanger life at 30. Okay, now tell me your possible normal life at 30. And then we'll just journal. I'll, I'll take dictation they'll just brainstorm and I'll just scribble wildly because I can't keep up. And then I'll kind of put it together for them next week in a nice neat way. And then they have it. And, and I get told that, you know, this, this kid tells me he, he reads them both like all the time. And it kind of puts the onus on him to be drawn into hopefully a more wholesome life instead of me browbeating him into it. 
to do, he draws himself into a, a better path. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll see. I have no idea. We'll, we'll find out in 15 years, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think um, for me, as a person of faith, that the story that I hold on to the most is that promise in scripture that there will be other workers to gather your hearts, right? So the seeds that you plant today will be gathered by someone else in the future. So, all right. Oh, Rita? It's okay. I, I was just thinking of something that Jeff, we were talking about in the breakout room. Jeff was saying, that there are very few Bible principles that are needed in guidance. The Bible's full of Bible principles. We know that. But with these children, and we have all recognized this over the years, with some very basic ones that they actually memorize in their heads and put in their hearts, and it pops back up. We've had them tell us, you know, I was in a such and such situation the other day, and I remember da 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 da. But they're very succinct. They're very short. They're their Bible principles that work 100% of the time. And when they can see those things and, and have them as a foundation, it does anchor them and their, and their, whole, their whole being it anchors them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was going to ask Jeff real early on as he was talking, I was going to ask him if he'd be willing to take a homework assignment and write down the concepts that you want to put forth, the lessons you want to put forth, and the Bible scriptures that go with them, because I thought that was great what you said, and I would love to have like a, a cheat sheet to, to work from. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Sounds oh, like something Jeff would do. <laughs> sure, I could, I could probably whip something out. I, mean, <laughs> I, I agree with you, though. That, that I try to use the Bible principle and then do what I call fast forward, which is really what you just said, right? Okay, we work with this, you know, you've got an anger issue or this person upsets you or um, you're offended by this, whatever it is, right? So you find a simple scripture with a principle and then you fast forward. Okay, if I apply this, how does this work out for you tomorrow or the next day or next week? If I don't apply this, how does this work out? So I, I try to take that approach that you have, make a practical application and let them explain to me, where is this going to lead me? Where am I going to wind up by doing it? And hopefully, and I try to find things that are very, you know, something from Proverbs or the Psalms or maybe uh, a sentence of, of something Jesus said, because if they're too long, they don't, they can't, it, it's got to be short. You know, mm -hmm. they, they got short attention spans. <laughs> And, and, you know, hopefully, you know, eventually, like, you, like Terry said, sometimes it may be down the road a year or two or three or four, who knows when, when it all kicks in, right? And they're like, okay, I, I really get it now. I, I see where all these folks are taking me. That's what we would like. Yeah. So if, if you go to um, our website, jw.org, and type in the search engine Bible principles, it will come up with apply Bible principles and it's for teens, for young people, for families, for uh, yeah, single adult, all, all walks of life. And it, it's super easy to application for them in the, in this, with the kids. And I think for the, the mentors, there's some, um, some of the worksheets, and tools that we have, there is one that is a change process worksheet that is exactly as Christian described, which is uh, if, if you change this, where do you see yourself in one year, five years, 10 years? If you don't change it, where do you see yourself in the same thing? So, and then it has them create their own mantra, right? So their own uh, phrase that helps them keep on track. So it's very similar there's people that come at, at it from a religious perspective and people that come at it from their secular mentoring perspective, but it's the same, it's the same exercise, <laughs> different ways. Reimagine, imagine that. Right. It's true. Right. 
All right. Is there any, here's our last chance to say anything. Anything anybody wants to say? All right. Um, I do. Okay. <laughs> it may not be on the same topic, but I volunteered for this Saturday. And I was just wondering if anybody from um, the King County Detention in Seattle, if anybody was going. I know you guys go different. Echo Glen and, and other places, but just kind of finding my group. Mm -hmm. I know JoJo goes and uh, Alyssa, but just wondering who goes on Saturday around 1045, I guess is the entry time. Yeah. So, just, so I'm not alone because I haven't been going for a while and I just want to make sure I'm following the rules. <laughs> I appreciate that. I was going to see, I have, um, in one of my folders somewhere, I have this uh, link to the schedule that Chica keeps. Um, but I'm not seeing it in front of my face right now. Hang on just a minute and I will tell you. Or actually, um, Gail, if you just hang on at the end of the meeting, then we can do uh, cover that really quick. Yeah, and uh, we will just, uh, yeah. yeah, have everyone return to their own walks at their own homes this evening away from me <laughs> so I, I, thank you terry anyway, i appreciate all of you and i hope that your time spent with youth uh, is maximized to its fullest potential and that you are able to transform hearts and minds Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.